Hello, baseball fans. This is King Ikabu coming to you live from the underground bunker. We're going to play a day in the history of baseball. The day is May the 15th, 1900. And we're going to play a day of the season. I am using the 1900 baseball season as my guinea pig season to perfect, hopefully perfect, uh, the ultra quick baseball and all the stats and everything. And my pitching... Uh, how should I say it? The pitching mechanic. So we can see the standings up to date as of May the 15th, 1900. The Pittsburgh Pirates lead the National League with a 14-6 and record. They have a 25-run differential, plus 25. The real pennant winners that year were the Brooklyn Super Buzz. And they are in second place, a game and a half behind, with a 12-7 and record and an 8 run differential the new york giants a little bit surprising team as they i think were in last place or second last place they uh, got to a good start 10 and 9 three and a half games back and eight plus eight in the run differential these are the only teams in a plus situation and run differential the other ones are all negative boston the boston bean eaters nine and nine four games back cincinnati reds nine and ten Four and a half games back, the St. Louis Cardinals, eight and eleven, five and a half games back, the Chicago Orphans, eight and thirteen, six and a half games back, and the surprisingly bad Philadelphia Phillies, seven and twelve, and they are also six and a half games back. So we'll just play a day in baseball, May the 15th, 1900, a Tuesday, and uh, we'll start here. Look at Gus Whaling. We're going to play Brooklyn at St. Louis. Gus Whaling is a starter for Brooklyn. His record so far, he hits his first appearance. So he will have a 0 0 record. 0 and 0. Good to see somebody gets in a game. Gus Whaling goes for Brooklyn and for St. Louis will be Jack Powell. I'm sure he's been in games. Jack Powell, oops, sorry about that. Scroll over is what I wanted. Jack Powell is 2-1, 266. So we'll put that in. 2-1. A 266 ERA for Jack Powell. And we bring the Brooklyn is over. Brooklyn is a TO. And St. Louis is an R1. St. Louis is at home. However, they have a negative home field advantage. So the final... So the way you work through this to get to the final grades, Brooklyn starts off at a T, and St. Louis's pitching is a 1, so it goes up to U, and then the right side of the home field advantage is, is it, wait a minute, it's a negative 1 slash 1, that means you subtract 1, you subtract minus 1 from Brooklyn. So if you subtract minus one, it becomes a positive. So they go up one. I hope that's, it's a, you know, if you add a negative number, it becomes a positive. So that's basically what it is. So T plus one becomes a U and the home field advantage gives them a V. St. Louis starts off as an R. Brooklyn has a zero pitching. So they stay as an R. However, their negative home field advantage is minus one, so it goes down to a Q. So Brooklyn is a V, St. Louis is a Q. And I should have brought up the uh, the charts. So I'll do that now, won't take long. Bear with me. All right, so we are going to roll now for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Just getting everything set up here. I guess I should have done this before. I just was so excited to broadcast today. Was not prepared. All right. Hope you're staying cool wherever you are, as it's even hot here in Tuktayaktuk. Got up to uh, 40 degrees today. You say, well, that's not very hot. Well, 40 degrees Celsius. So, uh, Celsius. Uh, what is that in Fahrenheit? It is 104. So it was 104 degrees today, which probably still isn't uh, very hot compared to where you are, but here 
it is hot for our well um i remember uh, in the 80s we had 40 degrees something like 50 days in a row here so uh it can get hot here too so here we go we're not playing this we're playing this so we're gonna roll for brooklyn as we to remind you there are v so we go to the v chart and we roll for the brooklyn super buzz they roll a 32 32 if it was a 31 they'd only score four but they scored a 32 so they scored five runs on st louis and now it's time for St. Louis to roll. They're a Q. Q. They have to roll. To stay in the ball game, they have to roll at least a 41. If they roll less than 41, they have to hit this BG to have any chance. And if they don't hit the BG, they lose the game. Here is the roll. 43. They do. So it's a tie ball game. 5-5. Five, five. So what do we do at this point? Well, this is where the King Icky Boo, uh, his mechanic pitching mechanic comes into play so we go back to brooklyn we look at this guy who's got his first appearance of the year gus whaling we look at his complete game percentage gus whaling has a 375 percent complete game percentage so to stay in the ball game and not to be out of the ball game he's got to roll less than 375 he does. He rolls 92. So he gets to stay in the game and pitch for the ninth inning. So Gus stays in. The manager of Brooklyn says, hey, we're going to give Gus another crack at it for the ninth inning. Now we roll for Jack Powell. Jack Powell's complete game number is 757. We will roll for 757. 962. It is higher than 757. So Jack Powell is out of the game. He gets pulled for the ninth inning. And who is the reliever? We go on the relief number. And of course, it can't be Jack Powell himself. So if we ignore any role that's 1 to 38, he cannot relieve himself. It has to be higher than 38. Here's the role. And 559 is Jim Huey. So Jim Huey is coming in to relieve. Jim Huey. You can see above Jim Huey has relieved a few times Hugh E and he came in after the eighth inning okay so now we go back and we roll for the ninth inning we look at the pressure chart pressure chart is right here we look at the pressure ratings for each team Brooklyn is an L St. Louis is an E so first of all we roll for the visiting Brooklyn Super Buzz. And they roll on L. So basically, to score in the ninth inning, they have to roll a 42 or higher. 42 or higher is what they're looking for. The roll is 33. They do not score in the ninth inning. Uh, we have to get the right one. There it is. Five. So they stay at five. We go to St. Louis. They have a chance to win right now. They are an E, I believe. E, yes it is. So we bring up the chart and we look at E. And for St. Louis to score and win the game, they have to roll 53 or higher. Here is the roll. 32. They do not score either. So we're going extra innings. So at this point, we go back to Brooklyn. And we say, thanks, Gus. You pitched a complete game, nine innings, but you're out of the game now. We're going to bring in our reliever right now. And it can't be Gus himself. Well, he actually didn't have any relief appearances so we don't have any threat of gus getting the roll so here is the roll 662 that is harry howell harry howell comes in he will be the reliever and he comes in in the ninth inning so now we go back to st louis and we start playing extra innings we go to the extra inning chart and i'm just going to bring this back to where it was so i don't have to keep switching back here's the extra inning chart Gonna scroll this over a little bit. All right. So now we roll on L for Brooklyn. You can see the Brooklyn's extra inning chart. They have to roll 42. If they roll 42 to 61, they score one run in extra innings. If they roll a 62, they get to 64, they score two runs in extra innings. And if 
They score, roll a 65 or 66, they score three runs. If they score less than 42, they score nothing. So here is their roll. 45. So Brooklyn scores one run in the top of the 10th. So we will go here and we go 10, 1. That means this, oops. Uh, sorry, apologize everyone. Of course, if I don't do this, 10, 1. So they score one run in the 10th. Now St. Louis has a chance. They have to roll 53 to 63 to tie the ball game and go into the 11th inning or if they score 64 to 66 they score two runs and win the game here is the roll or if they score less or roll less than 53 they lose the game they score 25 they do not score and so the game is over the brooklyn super Boz defeat the st louis cardinals by a score of six to five and they win or they lose in extra innings. So they get a home loss. They score five runs and they give up six. Now remember Jim Huey, he came in in the eighth or the ninth inning. So he pitched two innings and gave up one run. So first of all, we go to Jack Powell. You've got to give him credit for his eight innings of pitching. Jack Powell is the first pitcher. He's the ace of the staff. So we go to... N8, which means he has a no decision and pitched eight innings. And then he gave up five runs in those eight innings. Then we go find Jim Huey. Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And we got to find him here. Jim Huey, there he is. He pitched in relief. Here's the relief section. He got the relief loss. He pitched two innings and gave up one run. Okay. And then what I do, for, for instance, Powell. Powell has a 0.73 earn run to run percentage. So those five runs that he gave up, only 0.73 of those five runs are earned and go towards his earn run average. Let's look at Mr. Jack Powell as he has many appearances so far. You can see here he's had two complete game wins he has one complete game loss he has a nine inning no decision he has two eight inning no decisions and he's given up a total of 23 runs you multiply those 23 runs by 0.73 his earn run to run number and that comes up to 17 earn runs in 52 innings which leaves him for a 2.94 earn run average and a two and one record. Now, I, as I was playing this, as I was, usually I think in the shower, right? I'm in the shower and I'm thinking about, okay, what's, what's wrong? Something's wrong with this mechanic. And I came to me, what happens if you're on the road, you pitch a complete game and you lose, which means you don't pitch nine innings, you pitch eight innings. So I, for 1901, this is why 1900 is my guinea pig year. I'm, f I'm fiddling with things. I'm trying to perfect them. So now in 1901, I've already had this in the column, a complete game loss on the road, which is eight innings, not nine. I want this thing to be exact. I want it to be perfect. And so that's what I am working on. I'm getting there, but I think it works pretty darn well. Okay, so in this case... Um, you can see here the Jack Powell, his ERA went down, right? Because he, no, would it go up? It went up a little bit to 294, that's right. But he still has his 2-1 and one record. But Huey, he's down in his. So if I go back here and look at Huey, Huey now is 3-3 three and three, where he was 3-2 and two before. He, he's still leading the team in wins, but uh, he took another loss. He's, he's tied with the team lead in losses as well. Okay, so now we have to go back. We have the pitching. We have the game uh, stats here. They lost the game. They gave up five, or they scored five runs and gave up six. We have the pitching all done. Now we have to roll for the offense. We roll for the Cardinals, five runs. And now 
We have 10 players now, so there's a lot less other, okay? I, I wanted less other. There's still other because you still have guys, your runs that scored without an RBI. You still have uh, runs score or r r runs driven in by people that are not these 10 guys. So you still have to have other, but I just wanted to eliminate, you know, not eliminate, but have less other because other is depressing. You want to know who's driving in these runs. So there, home run number 60. You know, unlike today or unlike... You know, the 80s. When I think Cardinals, I think 80s. Okay, that's, to me, the Cardinals. They were a fast, exciting, base-running team that didn't hit any home runs. That's what I think of. So, it's the opposite here. They're one of the leaders in home runs back in 1900 with the 60 number. Most teams have around 30 to 40 for their home run number. Cardinals have 60, so it's, it's opposite of what it was in the 80s. But anyway, I'm rambling. So we run, we roll for five runs now for the Cardinals. 294 is higher than 60, so it's not a home run. 412 is the RBI number that goes to Patsy Donovan. Patsy gets the first run for the Cardinals in a losing effort. Here's the second roll. 946 is not a home run. 298. 298 is Jesse Burkett. Burkett or Burkett. Depends which side of the Mason-Dixon line you're on, I guess. I don't know. I just picked the Mason-Dixon line. It could be the Mississippi. I don't know. But Jesse Burkett or Burkett, you choose. 541 is not a home run. 384 is Patsy Donovan again. Patsy Donovan. We saw him a lot in our mad tournament. Patsy Donovan. He's a, pr a prominent role here in this in this uh, ultra quick baseball as well. That's three runs. 636, 152. Bobby Wallace. Bobby Wallace has an RBI today. And one more. Nine, 890 is not a home run. 839. That is Wilbert Robinson, who will later become a manager of Brooklyn. And they'll name the team the Robins after him. He is now playing at the end of his career with the Cardinals and drove in a run for them. So now we take this and we go back to Brooklyn. We have everything completed for the St. Louis Cardinals. We go back to Brooklyn and we now roll for Brooklyn. So they got a away win. They scored six, six runs and gave up five. We give Gus Whaling a nine-inning complete game. We just have to find him. Gus Whaling. Where's the bus, Gus? There he is. Okay, so he had a complete game win? No. Complete game loss? No. But he had a complete game nine-inning performance. And he gave up five runs. Then we find uh, his relief man, who I forget now, was Howell. Howell pitched one inning and gave up no runs and won the game. So we get he gets the win today in relief. We found find Harry Howell. There he is. He gets a relief win. He pitched one inning in relief and gave up no runs. So we have the game stats. We have the pitching stats. And now we roll for the hitting stats for the Brooklyn Super Buzz. And uh, Joe Kelly, Huey, Huey Jennings, Bill Dolan, Willie Keeler, Labe Cross, Tom Daly, Fielder Jones, who will leave after this season and go to Chicago. Jimmy Sheckard, who is a great cub, but stay, was at the beginning of the decade with the Super Buzz. And I think he even, did he go to, did he stay in Brooklyn or did he go, I'm getting Steinfeld. Wild uh, Steinfeld was with Cincinnati and went to the Cubs. I get those two guys mixed up sometimes. Sheckard is the one with Brooklyn. And Steinfeld was with the Reds before they saw the light and went for the Cubs with the 1905 to 1910 Cubs who were a magnificent. And I look forward very much to playing with those teams. Anyway, we're going to roll for... I mean, I got the wrong dice here. We're going to roll for the Brooklyn team. Six runs. 37. See, their number home. See, if that was St. Louis, that'd be a home run. But it's Brooklyn who doesn't hit any home runs. 32. So it's not a home run. And 293 
That is Bill Dolan. He drove, drives in the first run. Now this is a five and one, I call it, because they scored five runs and then they scored one in the bar on the top of the ninth. So that one's separate. Even if we have a home run by some miracle and it's a four run homer or something, we stop it. There's, if it goes into the sixth run, it doesn't, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to explain myself, but you, I'll try to explain it better when we see it, okay? So what? 133 is not a home run. 584 is Lave Cross. He drove in the run, the second run. The third run is not a home run. It was driven by 721, who is Fielder Jones. Three runs for Brooklyn. Four runs, 199. And 77, that's Joe Kelly. Their leading RBI man of 1900. And then, okay, so this is what I mean. Okay, this is the fifth run. Now, let's say by chance they get a home run. It has to be a solo shot because obviously they scored one run in the ninth inning to win the game. So it cannot be a, a two run homer at this point, is what I was trying to say. Hope that's clear. Uh, that's not a home run. So 880. 880 is Duke Farrell. Okay, so that's five runs. And now here's the winning run. How did they score the winning run in the top of the ninth? It was not by home run. It was 615. 615 is Tom Daly. And so he gets a yellow highlight because he drove in the winning run in the ninth inning. So now when we go back to our standings... We can see now that uh, Brooklyn is now only a game back of Pittsburgh as they won this game, and St. Louis is falling even closer to the bottom. Now, do we have to sort this? So I have macros, so it's easy. So yeah, we have to sort the pitching. So I go Control Shift B, and it it sorts out the pitching for Brooklyn. Actually, it wasn't needed. I just saw the ERA, but I do sort it by wins. So no need there. But we see that Harry Howell got his first win of the season in relief. Up to that point, he was 0-2, 6, probably 626 or something ERA. So he improved his record somewhat. And the leading RBI man is Joe Kelly. Huey Jennings has a home run and 14 RBIs. Fielder Jones is tied for second. If you look at the leaders... In uh, baseball, there's a couple guys here, and I've talked about. He's becoming one of my favorites. These are two of my favorites, just from playing the the uh, the Mad Tournament and now playing here. But Piano Legs Hickman, this guy, and I, as I quoted in that video, one of the videos I did back for that tournament, which I will continue. If I don't, know, I just it gets poor ratings, so I kind of put it off. Most things I have poor, have poor ratings. I just I just uh, you know I just put it up there, and people want to watch it. That's fine. But if uh, you know, I really enjoy Charlie Hickman, Piano Legs Hickman. I did some research on him, and people who played with him 20 years later that saw Ruth, okay, they said, and I know people are biased with their era, but there's a couple of people quoted saying that Hickman, Piano Legs Hickman, had the same kind of power that Ruth had. Now, take it for what it's worth. I know people always think their era is the best era and all that. People still do this. I do this. My era is the 70s and 80s. That's, you know, I think Ken Dryden was the one who said it. Who is the greatest team of all time? Who is, what is the greatest, what is the golden era of hockey? I think that's what he was asked. And his answer, very wise answer. He was, he's, Ken Dryden is a, a, is a thinker, okay? He said, the golden age of hockey is whatever age, whatever time that was when you were 12 years old. That is the golden age of hockey or baseball or whatever for you. And that makes sense. Late 70s, golden age for me, right? And so, uh, you know... I say that today about today's baseball. You know, what is this baseball? It's got this, uh, you know, ball that's flying everywhere. It's juiced, you know, and people think it's such a big deal to hit. Oh, home runs are cheapened, okay? Home runs don't mean as much because there's, they're flying out of the ballpark like crazy, right? I think it cheapens, I think the late 70s was perfect balance right there. I mean, they had 
a lot of you had offense and you had great pitching you had both and you have great pitching today but i mean i don't know it just seems to be cheaper in my mind but yeah i was 12 years old the golden age of baseball for me but anyway that's what people you know said in the 20s about piano legs hickman that he he had the equal power to ruth and take it for what you're worth don't just doubt it i think this is what people do they just doubt things you know that sound new to them wow nobody had the power of ruth nobody 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 but you know hey these people were there we weren't there we don't know we've never seen we've only seen babe ruth in you know video you know the little clips with his you know skinny little legs and his big body and you know we only seen that we have never seen charlie piano legs hickman maybe he did have that kind of power but if we just know that the ball in the first decade of the 20th century if you didn't hit a home run in the first three innings that ball was basically a big ball of yarn by the end of the game a big nerf ball which was impossible to hit out of the ballpark and so very few home runs were hit so who knows Anyway, this guy, Charlie Hickman and Elmer Flick, these are two guys becoming two of my favorites. Flick, the Hall of Famer, Hickman not, but they are leading the way, not Honus Wagner, not Sam Crawford, uh, not Ed Delahanty. It is Charlie Hickman and Elmer Flick that are leading the way so far in this uh, season. So I'm happy about that. Anyway, so that's the first game. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get through the whole day. Maybe we'll just play one more. I don't want to keep you. I know you can cut the video off anytime you like, but uh, well, unless we have real fun with this one. I don't know. Let's see. Boston. The Boston Bean Eaters. Now let's, let's, I don't know. Were they the Bean Eaters? I'm working on the 1929 football. It's a challenge because they don't have any very little stats. So, but I'm trying to work on that. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm having fun with these old seasons. It's great. But anyway, let's go to 1900. And were they the Brooklyn Bean or Boston Bean Eaters then? I know they had several names. And uh, here are the standings. Boston was third place. The Bean Eaters, yes. So uh, the Bean Eaters and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Pittsburgh Pirates currently are in first place. We're just copying the stats to take over to Pittsburgh. It could be there already. I don't know. Yeah, it's all set up already. I knew that need to do that. But anyway, Deacon Fil Felipe. Felipe or Philippe is going for Pittsburgh. And so far this season, he's one of the top pitchers in the game. Oh, I'm getting mixed up with Tannehill. Uh, he's still good. 2-2, two and two, 277 ERA. For Felipe or Philippe, I'm sure that uh, Beatles Eternally could correct me on how to pronounce his name. Deacon Philippe. We'll just go with that until I hear otherwise. He's 2-2, two and two, 277, and going for Boston, Kid Nichols. Kid Nichols is, is going for Boston, and Kid Nichols is we have to scroll over a little bit for him kid nichols he's got a good record 40325 he's a leading pitcher for boston so he's putting his perfect record on the line today 40325 era let's go to pittsburgh and let's play this one out so pittsburgh lost the first game to boston boston's doing very well uh what was their record 66 and 72 and yet they are nine and nine so they're doing better than projected so far this season they're s minus three so you take your offense you take the other team's defense or pitching minus three becomes a p and then their home field of pittsburgh is neutral so it stays a p pittsburgh r pit boston's pitching is zero stays an r so pr is what we're going to roll here today. And we bring this up. Get out of the extra innings chart. And we're rolling for P for Boston. P for Boston. Here's the P chart. We're going to roll for them. 13 is a bad roll. They only score two runs. 
So they're going to need a lot of help from the dice. They're only two columns over. But in order for Boston to survive this game, Pittsburgh is going to have to roll 11 or 12. Otherwise, they win. Unless they get a 53 and then they get minus 5 or, you know, columns way down. So here's the roll for Pittsburgh. 33, 4 runs. So the score is Pittsburgh 4, Boston 2. So now we go and we award Pittsburgh their win. They increase their lead in the National League. They score two run, four runs. They allow two. Deacon Felipe, Felipe, Felipe is uh, the winner. He pitched a complete game and gave up two runs. He's the ace of the staff, so he's right away. Won, he won complete game win and gave up two runs. And for some reason, I hit two and it didn't work. There we go. So we have the team stats, we have the pitching stats, and now we roll for their four runs for Pittsburgh. Four runs for Pittsburgh. Their home run number is 43. Here's the roll. 811 is not a home run. 130, that is Honus Wagner. He drives in the first run. Driving in, we're rolling for the second run. 828 is not a homer. 488 is Tom... O'Brien. And this Bones Ellie. Bones Eli, Bones Ellie, Bones Bones Ellie. He's, I think, leading the team in RBIs so far. He he gets so many rolls. But not so far today. 222 is not a home run. 113 is Honus Wagner. He's going shooting for Bones Ellie. Or Eli. Bones Eli, Bones Ellie. I'm not sure. He has a marvelous mustache. That's all I know. Okay, and here's the final run, 590, 151. That's Honus Wagner. He has seven runs driven in in the last three games, as you can see. Eight, he hit. He has runs driven in in his last five games. We can see Bonezelli. He scored a lot of runs in the beginning of the season. So that's it for Pittsburgh. Now we get the get this information. Oops, that's this one here. Two four. Sometimes I get fooled when I don't complete it. There we go. 2-4. Boston loses. They drop below 500. Now, I always wondered why for other teams like St. Louis. Okay. St. Louis National League team. Uh, they got a second team. The St. Louis Browns moved from Milwaukee in 1902. And St. Louis... Because I'm assuming because the Cardinals were there first, they embrace you know they just loved the Cardinals and they didn't care anything about the Browns. I think uh, you know like it was 80% of St. Louis loved the Cardinals, 20% loved the Browns. It was something like that. Uh, other teams, Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia was first. The Phillies were first. The Athletics came there. Athletics had. Numerous championships, great dynasties from uh, 1909 to 1915. They were great from like 1928 to 1933 around there. They were incredible. They've had won championships. And yet the people of Philadelphia love the Phillies who didn't win anything until 1980. And the athletics left town. Uh... Why in the world did the people of Boston embrace the Red Sox and didn't care anything about the Bean Eaters slash Braves? It was the opposite for Boston. So that's food for thought. Maybe you have a theory on that. Why did the people... They, and right from the start. I mean, when they were the Americans, they, they loved the Boston Americans and they had the Boston Braves, the uh, Boston Bean Eaters... They had them, you know, from the beginning, and yet they didn't care about them. I, I, I kind of always wondered that, so if you have any theories on that, then please let me know. Anyway, we rolled and we got them, so we give them, the Bean Eaters, a home lo or way loss. They scored two runs and gave up four. Kid Nichols, his perfect record is over as he loses today's ball game. He only gave up four runs, which was very little for 1900s. Very offensive year. 
And yet he takes the loss. They just rolled a 13, and that was it. No hope for his perfect record. So Boston is another good home run team, 71. And that's why I think they lead the league in homers. They have 12. Um, well, Brooklyn has two. Chicago is five. Cincinnati, six. New York, six. Philadelphia, five. Pittsburgh, four. St. Louis, eight. So, yeah, like Boston has 12 homers, which is pretty darn good for this era of baseball. So we're going to roll for the two runs. The first one, 35. They hit another home run. Who hit it? 870. 870 is Billy Sullivan. Billy Sullivan hit the hit the home run. Is it a one-run homer or a two-run homer? Here's the roll. 744. We look on the chart. And 744 is just... No, it's higher than 521. So yes, it's a two-run homer for Billy Sullivan. And that's all the rolling we need to do. He drove in both runs on a home run. So that one is it. So now we look to the up-to-date standings. And we see that uh, we already talked about Brooklyn. Brooklyn came within a game, but now they're a game and a half back again as Boston drops below 500 to 10 and, 9 and 10. And New York has uh, a whole game ahead of Boston now. So that is the up-to-date standings. Uh, we have to do a sort here because Billy Sullivan in his home run, that's his fourth homer of the season. Does that lead the league now? Uh, control N sorts Boston. And so Billy Sullivan has four home runs. He passes John Ganzel of Chicago, who had three. He passes Piano Legs Hickman, who had three. Oh, Elmer Flick. He has five. He still leads the league. He has all the homers. For Philadelphia is by Elmer Flick. Honus Wagner has the team lead now. Well, he did before, I guess. I just didn't. I was comparing Wagner to these two guys. I think he had three home, three RBIs, so now he's up to 19. He's making a big push for the league lead. Turkey Mike Donlin has two homers and 14 for St. Louis. But that is how we work ultra quick baseball so that you have pitching. You have pitching numbers. You have home runs and RBIs, you've got all the stats, and you have quick games. You can get through a lot of games in a short time. So that's where my time, I mean, I'm of course, I'm still working every day on this. I have a video to go up soon for this. I just finished that. And of course, this is my first priority is... National Pastime 3, just because I've spent four years on this thing. And uh, I just completed, uh, I'm just, the, the Cardinals are facing the last place Reds. And just to take a look at that, Montreal's chasing them. But, you know, when St. Louis gets to play Cincinnati and Montreal, who do they have to play now? They are playing... Probably, well, have to be a tougher team because uh, you can't get... Yeah, they're playing the Dodgers. So, good chance that the Expos are going to fall further behind here. They just... They got right up and tied them one day. And, of course, St. Louis, you know, it's just almost like, uh, you know, you got this uh, racer, you know, in this uh, long-distance race. And Montreal's struggling, and they're, they're just about to catch up to the leader, you know. And then they got right near them. Right next to him, they get right beside him, and then the leader just kind of looks and says, who are you, and takes off. You know, that's the Cardinals. They're just playing with Montreal at this point. They get to play uh, Cincinnati, and they'll probably sweep them, and then Montreal has to play the Dodgers, who are, you know, much better than their record. They were, you know, they were the American, National League West champions this year, so uh, chances are they're going to fall further behind. But, uh... Good old Toronto, although they had a tough time with Detroit. Detroit gave them, won three out of four over Toronto, but they still have a three-game lead and Baltimore is four. And now, you look at Toronto. Toronto, who they play for the rest of the year? They play the Angels, the Athletics, 
the Mariners, the Twins, the Mariners, the Athletics, the Angels, and the Twins. Look where these teams are. Mariners, Twins, Angels. The only team that's at 500 is, are the A's. And in real life, they were below 500. So they have an easy schedule. Why these Milwaukee and Baltimore are fighting with the East the rest of the way, facing New York, who's desperate to get out of last place. Boston, who is fading, I'm sorry to say. Cleveland, who's holding their own. Detroit, who's a great team. And each other, Milwaukee and Baltimore, Toronto gets to play these guys. So if Toronto doesn't win this division, it's, you know, they can only smack themselves because they have a fa the, by far the most favorable schedule in the last month of the season. Anyway, we're not even talking about this. I'm just talking about what my priority is which always will be this. And this takes up a good hour every day. You know, I you know I work 50, 60 hours a week. I hour commute. And, uh, you know, this takes an hour of my time. So there's not much left over. And, you know, you know, I'd love to be doing more stuff. I'd love to be doing more, you know, community stuff even. But, you know, by nature, I'm not a community guy. I'm a kind of a loner. But, uh you know, but, you know, I got so much going on. I got so much to do. And uh, it's hard to always put up videos and that. But uh, I'm not making excuses. I'm just explaining myself. Anyway, this will be my first priority always. But my whole point is my second priority has become Downey Games. I just love that I'm not bogged down. I have just about everything. Got the CFL. I mean, for, I don't know how much it was, 15 bucks or something. Fifth, the CFL was the greatest bargain because uh, the CFL for 15 bucks you get every season in CFL history from 19 what is the first year they have 1960 1959 1958 1958 all the way to 2016 to 2016 you got every season for 15 bucks for the CFL and you say well that's the CFL but hey I'm a Canadian guy I grew up loving the CFL and loving the Eskimos so I you know I don't like 1963 but I mean the Eskimos were a powerhouse in the 50s. They were had a horrible 60s. And then the 70s, they were great. They got better and better. And then 1978, well, the 77, they were robbed. Uh, they played in Montreal, basically on ice. And Montreal knew their stadium. They played at home in the Grey Cup. Montreal, even though Edmonton... You know, we're right there with them. And Montreal knew their home field. They knew what it was like when it was ice. They knew how to prepare for it. They played with special shoes. Edmonton tried playing with regular shoes, regular cleats, and they couldn't get any footing. So it was like a joke of a, a great cup. I don't think it was, you know, a blowout or anything. anything. What was the 77 great cup? 77 great cup. Was it a blowout? It was, it was, Montreal had their home field advantage and they, oh yeah, it was a blowout, 41 to 6. It was, there's no way the, the ice ball, there's no way that the Eskimos were 41 to 6 worse than Montreal. They just had all, they had this, yeah, see, the playing surface was more for hockey than football and Montreal knew how to play on this because that was their home field they knew what type of shoes to wear. And, and, you know, they're at home. They could improvise. Edmonton was on the road in Montreal, away from home. They just had the shoes that they came with. And they it was it was a joke. You know, they couldn't do anything. And so, uh, yeah, so this guy here, Tony Proudfoot, responsible for the cleverest ploy in Grey Cup history. And the, he, they said, we know... It was ice cold and a big snowstorm. We know what to do. We wore broom ball shoes and with staples in them. And if, you, if you're not Canadian, you probably don't know what broom ball is. We played broom ball in phys ed. Basically, if you don't want to, if you don't like skating, 
but you like ice, you play on a hockey rink with uh, broom ball shoes, and you have a broom, and you have a ball, and you play some, basically play hockey, hitting a ball, like a ball about the size of a volleyball, you hit a volleyball into a net, and uh, I think the net was the same size as a, as a hockey net, but you didn't have a goalie with, uh, you know, big Michelin man uh, equipment on. You just had a regular sized dude in net, so it was about the same. So we played broom ball a lot, and you had special shoes, so they just went home, or just, you know, they were home, and they just got their broom ball shoes, and they put staples in them, and uh, they just had the advantage. And uh, they were, well, the Eskimos were just slipping and sliding. And you can imagine playing football on pure ice. And that's what it was. So they won 41-6 to because, you can see, it was the big factor in that win. We have the staple gun. Uh, you know, so here, Larry Highball right here. Larry Highball was like the fastest guy in the league. He was a defensive back for Edmonton. He was the fastest guy, and you have this quarterback, Jerry Dottilio, who was like a tight end, who couldn't run faster than my grandmother, ran past Larry Highball, who's the fastest guy in the league for a law big game, because Larry Highball, where was he from? I mean, he's, he's not used to ice. He was born where? Snellville, Georgia. I mean, huge disadvantage. And so, yeah, that, it was a joke. So Eskimos could have won this game. Then they went on and won the next five games in a row, five great cups in a row. So, yeah. So that's a dynamic. I look forward to playing those games and everything like that. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'm just rambling on. Anyway, this is it. King Ikbu signing off from Pittsburgh, where the final score, the Pittsburgh Pirates 4 and the Boston Bean Eaters 2. See you next time. Goodbye, everybody.